Welcome to 219 West, a news program produced by students here at the CUNY Graduate School of Journalism. I'm Naisha Rose. On 219 West, we bring you topics and stories that you can't find anywhere else. This month, we're bringing you stories from across the city. First up, Natasha Scully shows us how a broken windows policing has gone underground. I've just seen some guys doing some, some, some moves outside on the street. It looked like they were just crawling on the ground, like rolling over in circles on the dirt and stuff. But they wasn't rolling on the dirt. They were spinning on their heads. What Rashim saw was break dancing. And as soon as I said it, I just embraced it and ran with it. Rashim ran with it all the way to Canada where he competed. But nothing could top the thrill Rashim felt performing for a crowd on New York City streets. The lefts, the rights, the backs, the, to the beats, the stops, the fronts. 18 years ago, Rashim was b-boying, just like these kids. But in the late 90s, Rashim was arrested while breakdancing and charged with disorderly conduct for playing music on his radio without a permit. I've been arrested in the New York City streets where I was born and raised up more than 25 times. The last time he was arrested was just days after NYPD announced a crackdown on performers in subway cars and platforms. His arrest was one of more than 300 subway busts last year, twice the number than the previous year. It was all part of the broken window model of policing, which recognizes that low-level offenses against public civility and public order cannot be allowed to continue because they send a message to the larger community that law has broken down. So there's public parks, there's schools, there's their own houses, there's community centers. Uh, that's a perfectly valid activity and form of expression. Heather McDonald, a fellow at the Manhattan Institute, insists she's not against dancers. Just the location b-boyers like Rashim are choosing to break a move. They're there because they want to collect money. This is not a selfless artistic expression. It's not about just making money. It's about becoming a better person and understanding that when you really need to dance and nobody's there for you, you can do it by yourself and still captivate the whole audience. Alex Vitell, a sociologist at Brooklyn College who studies police tactics, says arresting breakdancers could be counterproductive. Relying on a strategy of criminalization just further undermines the relationship between the police and young people who are dancing and possibly driven them into other kinds of black market activities that might even be more of a problem for the city. I can't build trust in the police when they're trying to stop us from breakdancing by scaring us. You don't build trust in somebody that's supposed to protect you by making them afraid. Rashim has a job now, ironically, as a security guard. It, it, it's weird, very weird that I go to work as security and then I'm breakdancing, which I'm getting arrested by a person just like me. Still, he says he'll continue to perform on the subway and to solicit donations. If entertainment is a crime, then you might as well shut America down. Because that's what we live for. Next, Lucina Malesio takes us to outer space with a story about stars in the city. <laughs> Times Square. Lights compete for everyone's attention. It's so full of lights and also so colorful and even if it's, not, if it's night, you just think it's day. But there are some glittery lights that can't be seen here. Can you see the stars from here? Oh, 
No, not really. Nothing like home. You walk outside and the stars are just perfect. But we do like the lights instead of the stars right now. Even in the outer boroughs, it's hard to escape the bright lights. This is very, very bright. There are floodlights that are lighting up the museum and then you have light reflected off the museum. There's lights going up, literally up into the sky. Irene Peace is an amateur astronomer. I'm happy to show you some darker sites. There's actually a really dark site right nearby. I think it's an amazing contrast. Yet, but it can take a while to cool off. We're getting a little bit of shimmering. Um, if you want to take a look, you're welcome to do so. Um, so many people have never seen the Milky Way. They, they don't even know what it is. They don't know that it can be seen. Uh, people who live in large cities don't even know that they can see stars. Um, they just look up and they see something bright and assume it's a plane. And it's, it's just really unfortunate to be, to be losing that um, as a society, just flooded with light all the time. Irene's not the only one who wants to see more stars in the city. There's a whole movement that wants to dim the city's lights. I'm what they refer to as a dark sky advocate. And I have been working on this issue for about the last uh, 15, almost 20 years. Susan wanted to show me her latest okay, victory. I want to show you some lights over here. The new fixtures that are in Washington Square are the dark sky fixtures. It's actually made the ground very, very well lit, but you don't have the glare in your face from the bulbs, and it's almost romantic. And now her sights are set on the city as a whole. You will see some building lighting in Manhattan where the intensity of it could be cut. You'd still enjoy and see the skyline, but it's brighter than it needs to be. Uh, it's a long process to get people to believe in a reduction of light pollution. The Dark Sky Movement found a believer in Linda Rosenthal, a state assembly member representing Manhattan's west side. The city is such a frenetic place and you're always rushing and you need ways to just relax and, you know, looking up at the stars is, is a great thing to do, but not if you don't see the stars. So we have to ensure that dark skies uh, remain something that, that people can, can see and that it's not obscured by too much lighting. Linda succeeded in passing a law last year that requires all state-funded buildings to use shielded light fixtures like those in Washington Square and Gantry Plaza State Park. New York will certainly still be a shiny city and, you know, I'm working on, on, on other bills and other projects to, to promote the fact that we have too much light. Um, and not just in the city, around the state, there's too much light. There's, so this hopefully will be a guide for um, other cities to implement their own regulations. The new law only affects a small number of lights in the city. And because it's not retroactive, it will take several years before all state-funded buildings replace their old fixtures. For Irene, the new law hasn't had any effect. She's still looking for dark spots. Elcor and Mizar, the stars in the bend of the handle of the Big Dipper. The dark sites are getting so much harder to find, everyone's going to suffer from that a bit. I think that's an important part of our heritage as human beings. It's something that we share with every other human being that's ever lived. Like, everyone's been able to look up and see the stars, and honestly, they haven't changed that much throughout the course of human existence. So we really do share the same night sky, and that night sky is, is dwindling. And now, a short documentary from Alden Nusser about one of the last practitioners of a dying trade. This is a 1967 Rockola jukebox. I consider this to be my uh, engineering degree. Um, I first got this when I was 16 and um, wasn't in working condition, was missing the speakers, uh, was brought into day. my house, took the thing apart, figured out how to Okay, 
Okay, you got what you needed out of this Definitely. machine? Definitely, yeah. I'm Perry Rosen, and I'm one of the last people in the uh, area in the United States that's uh, capable of uh, repairing mechanisms on uh, all antique jukeboxes from the 1930s right up through the year 2000. All right, this is a uh, 1959 Seaberg jukebox. Here we have my 1941 Wurlitzer jukebox. This is a Wurlitzer Model 1015 jukebox. This is uh, Nickelodeon. It's the uh, first machine to play. Uh, and uh, the way it works is, um, the toy bag. Yeah. Let, let's do yeah. it again. Yeah. Let, me, let me get these phones off the hook here. Paris. Yeah, maybe he could help you with that. I mean, he knows more than you do. The rock cola is sick. It's been sick since New Year's. So it just more. kept spinning. Oh, that looks like it might be the problem. Ah, bingo. You have some action here. In the 1970s, very early 1970s, there was a song, Palabras, Palabras, and the song itself was, could not find it for love of money. I wound up doing search on the internet, and I found it in French. And this is it. Yeah, this is it. So tell us, tell us, bring us back to that uh, martini bar on 18th Street. It wasn't a martini bar, it was a sleaze bar that we were having martinis in. Um, but um, it, it was a lot of fun. It was a lot of fun. But you have this beautiful story of love that I will never forget. It's so easy. about as easy as they get. I'm happy about that though. I didn't want a major problem there where a motor or something has to be changed. How did you feel watching them dance? That was sweet. Yeah, it was nice, yeah. Do you, do you often get situations like that? What, just blowing fuse? You know, situations where you get to see the people enjoy their... See them dance, I've seen them cry. So does that, does that bring up any emotion inside you? Uh, not really, just, you know, it feels good to be able to uh, be in a business that, uh, that makes people happy, that gives people joy. Next, we visit a man who is saving rare frogs from extinction. Frog species are going extinct faster than scientists can even discover them. A huge range of environmental factors like climate change, habitat destruction, pollution, and infectious diseases are dwindling amphibian populations around the world. Amphibians are declining much faster than any other animal group that we've seen in the past. 
is this the next mass extinction? And you know, some of the evidence suggests that it, it probably is. You know, it's it's happening not in the blink of an eye like for dinosaurs, but it's happening faster than it should be, than it's ever happened um, in recent history. To fight this population decline, scientists need a backup plan. Oh, these guys are either wrestling or f***ing right now. They're still kind of active, but they... We want sort of an insurance colony, right? So a colony that uh, we can keep safe, that we can control their conditions, and if, worst case scenario, we lose that population in the wild, well, maybe we can take this assurance colony and repopulate that that area. Colin Clark is the curator at Rana Verde Ecosystems in the Bronx. It's a private breeding facility for rare amphibians and reptiles. The idea would be then if if that does like wipe out a population or you know really diminish a population you can then have these animals that yeah. are in captivity mm -hmm. you can like exactly them. yeah the only way to stop it is to pull the animals out of the wild and keep them in a facility like this and then hopefully you can repopulate that area. Colin has a bachelor's degree in ecology and evolution. He is not a world-renowned frog ecologist. He is not an expert herpetologist. He's just great at making frogs have sex with each other. There's no reason to think that because a scientist specializes in amphibians that they are also very good at breeding them, right? It's an expertise. It's, it's a practical, hands-on thing. And if you have experience and you have a touch that you can somehow make poison dart frogs breed in captivity, like, why not? <laughs> I think that's fantastic. These are Adelopus toads. The genus is the most endangered group of animals on the planet. Uh, most of like the 100 plus species are critically endangered if not already extinct. This is Anatheca spinosa, the crown tree frog. There's maybe two or three populations of these left in the wild per country. So this is the lemur tree frog, Agalichnis lemur. So they're considered critically endangered. Um, they're, they only maybe have a handful of populations left in both Costa Rica and Panama. So these are big conservation concern. So we have one of the most extensive collections of rare and endangered amphibians in a private collection. So we probably have about, on average, around 400 animals at any given time. And that number's always changing because there's always new things coming. You know, we always have things that are breeding. So we always have babies coming out of the water from tadpoles. You have to order crickets for there. Things are going to die. I'm gonna go out and get crickets in a little while. I got real serious about them in like sixth grade. That was when I got my first poison dart frog. And I was like, already like breeding chameleons and lizards at that point. So I was you like, were breeding lizards and chameleons in sixth grade? Oh yeah. Um, were you into punk in sixth grade too? No. No? No, I think like the next year I kind of got into punk. Or like eighth grade. I first met Colin through punk. He sang in a hardcore band called Working Stiff. Besides all the crickets, caring for 400 amphibians and reptiles every day takes a lot of yeah. grunt work. Don't do it too much, you'll break it. It's pumped. Like if you do it anymore, it'll explode basically. Oh, well, that'd be fun. Shit. First thing I do in the morning is I mist everybody down. Yeah, you do. Get them all wet. nice and wet, nice and steamy. So they need to be in a wet area where they can maintain basically osmotic equilibrium with the environment. Mm -hmm. Word. Yeah, you're good at this. Tell me when it's done. That's good. Many of these species have never been kept before in captivity. So it's sort of a race against time to figure out how to maintain them, how to breed them, because they're very unique, rare species with different sorts of reproductive biologies that many keepers just aren't familiar with. Jeez, there are so many species of frogs that are critically endangered or going to be critically endangered soon or declining in the wild before we even know that they're there. There's too many for zoos to be working with. There's just not enough resources. So we are here to act as sort of another vessel, another amphibian arc to work with these species and help maintain them in captivity when they're gone in the wild. Scientists are still struggling to understand why so many of these frogs are disappearing. They may be an indicator for what's next. There are fewer degrees of separation between the health of frogs and the health of humans than people like to 
admit or that people um, are aware of. You know, if you've got a whole population that's kind of keeling over or they've disappeared and it's not just one population, but it's multiple populations and it's not just in one area, it's all around the world. I mean, that's, that's a pretty big canary in the coal mine, right? Now, Tiana Lee introduces us to a music class with a different beat. This is not your typical music class. These kids are the most positive people I've ever met in my entire life. They come in the classroom with so much love and they've taught me so much. You know, these kids go through so many obstacles daily, but still every day they come in with a smile on their face and ask me how I'm doing and just show so much. They just give me so much love and energy. These students all have some form of vision impairment and cognitive delays. Some also have physical disabilities. Speaking up is a very scary thing for a lot of people and especially beatboxing by making silly sounds. Sometimes it feels unnatural, but when the kids let go and they just learn to have fun and be silly and use their voice, it's really powerful. Kayla Milady teaches the beat rockers class at the Lavelle School for the Blind in the Bronx. Milady's main instrument is her mouth. The method is beatboxing. I'm using beat rhyming as a way to help with speech therapy. Um, so we take uh, words like baseball or butter, um, and then we do, instead of just saying baseball, you enunciate all the words. So baseball, butter, which is all beatboxing sounds. So any of those, any alphabet letter that you can use, if we just staccato it and really just uh, hit the actual sound that we're trying to portray, you're beatboxing. So a lot of kids who have problems with enunciation, um, by teaching them, by going teeth, teeth, tooth, Tuesday. By getting them to enunciate it and really hit those notes, it's actually helping their speech because then when later they just say Tuesday without Tuesday, it comes out a lot clearer. It's not all about having fun. It's also a learning experience for the kids. For Milady, music is key to teaching the students social skills that will help them outside of the music room. Everyone's speaking out more and trying and being okay to fail, which is, I think, a really important and beautiful thing for anybody. Um, I'm teaching them a lot of new sounds that are hard to do, and they're all gung-ho and ready to do it. Ashley Marisu is a 17-year-old blind beat rocker. Although she faces other cognitive delays in her learning, music comes naturally to her. Marisu has the ability to memorize songs, play them on the piano, and sing them at the same time. Every Wednesday, she looks forward to class so she can jam with Miss Kayla and the other students. I come to Beat Rockers, when I have that mic, it's like somebody just takes the, um, it's like I'm the queen. I could do whatever I want to. I could sing whatever I want. There's a lot of students too that since we've been doing beat rhyming, I can hear that their speaking is getting clearer. So that's very exciting and it's rewarding too because as much as um, you know, we always want to have fun, if I can actually help them in a way that is more substantial than just having fun and leaving the classroom, um, it's really important and it's satisfying for me as a teacher. It's everything, it's the mic, the music. When you feel the music, it's like it's, it goes on and on and on and on, just like the Journey song. Goes on and on and on and on and on. Our last piece comes from Margaret Ward who shows us Britney Hysteria is alive and well. When you hear the name Britney Spears, you probably think of outlandish outfits, seductive dance moves, and of course, the world's obsession with her. But those are all pop memories of the 90s, right? Wrong. In 2015, there are still Britney Spears fan clubs, like this one right here in Brooklyn. And it's not what you think. 
a lot of people love Britney without knowing how to channel that into like knowledge. You know, Britney isn't the number one story anymore. Um, so I think you know, loving her music and listening to like her deep cuts is a little strange in 2015. Uh, but there are tons of people who do it. Britney has changed these people's lives over more than one generation. I think my proudest moment as a Britney fan was my little sister was born in 1998 and her first words were Britney Spears. Oh! <laughs> Whoa, a trauma memory. Rachel Goldberg and Suri Ratnatunga are friends who have a mutual love for Britney. So they decided to start hosting workshops in Goldberg's apartment. For $20 a pop, participants listen to the presentation and discuss the deep themes Britney represents. She's very consciously constructed this uh, sexual, sexual image in order to play off on a lot of these stereotypes. And she's really played off on this virginal sexual kind of thing and how that's carried through her career as something that she's uh, profited off of in a feminist way because she's working within a system that's pretty patriarchal. But in 2007, the breakdown came. For some fans, this was the end. But for these Britney loyals, that's where her power really started to make sense. This is her divorcing herself from her public image. This is her being like, I'm not that per You think I'm a sex symbol? I'm gonna shave off my all my hair, and I'm not gonna be a sex symbol to you guys anymore. And I think all of this rebelling was just her being like, I'm not gonna be what you think I am anymore. Pushing those buttons and that space in between. Um, and it's actually a really empowering feminist thing in many ways to identify that, to play on that, and then to make money off of that. You know, she's working in the system and she's made an empire. And, you know, she's a pretty savvy businesswoman, which is, you know, empowering feminism. Most of the participants see Britney as a symbol of empowerment. Um, I think my favorite Britney is post freak out Britney because she's a little dirtier. <laughs> Craziness uh, has always been linked to womanhood. Britney again, that video that had the word baby every time also has the, that, the word crazy. You know, she's used the word crazy many times throughout her career. Uh, first in a bubblegum sugary way, like you drive me crazy, and then um, you say I'm crazy, I got you crazy in Womanizer, which I think is super empowering. You know, she really comes to embrace this concept of crazy. Their goal is for these workshops to grow into something bigger. Goldberg's brother sees that already starting to happen. She's into Britney Spears, who isn't? Uh, but to see her leading a bunch of people that all share that enthusiasm, that fervor, really was interesting for me to see that, oh, it's not just my sister. This is a whole movement of people. Goldberg and Ratnatunga have a few more workshops planned for the spring. They are all sold out. The plan is to expand this um, since it's selling so well. Um, and, you know, maybe do other classes. Um, you know, at the end of our Britney 101, we're kind of we're asked about the 201, like what's the next step going to be? Um, we definitely want to do kind of like a reunion event for everyone who's attended so far, uh, just because it's a really wonderful community uh, in New York of people who love Britney that, you know, it, it's surprising to us that there are people who love her as much as we do, but uh, we definitely want to get all those people together. With Britney Spears about to drop a new single with Iggy Azalea in May, the workshops will have plenty to talk about. Thank you for watching 219 West. Catch us next month for a batch of offbeat New York stories. Be sure to tweet us with story ideas that you'd like to see. I'm Naisha Rose, and see you next month.